Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12735 in the name of Maurice Golden on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out our business programme for today, tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, if anyone objects, please say so now. And I call on Maurice Golden to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. And no one is asked to speak against the motion. The question therefore is that motion 12735 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is topical questions. We start with question number one from Ian Gray. To ask, <coughs> excuse me, to ask the Scottish Government how it plans to meet its 2020 target for childcare provision in light of a recent survey that found only 30% of private nurseries are likely to offer the full 1,140 hours of funded early learning and childcare. Minister Marie Todd. We recognise and value the key role that providers in the third and private sectors have to play in the expansion of funded early learning and childcare, particularly in delivering the flexibility that families need. We know that getting funding right is key to securing the participation of providers from all sectors in the expansion. And that's why we acted after this survey was conducted and reached a landmark deal with COSLA on the expansion. This means that funding will reach almost one billion per year by the end of the Parliament, exactly the action that 81% of the survey respondents were looking for when they said that a better funding rate would enable them to offer 1140 hours. Ian Gray. Well, uh, President Officer, I think that the National Day Nursery, Nursery Association uh, will indeed know uh, about the deal with COSLA. In fact, I heard that point put to the Chief Executive of the NDNA yesterday uh, on radio and she was very clear that her concerns are not addressed uh, by the COSLA deal. This is uh, serious because in some councils 40, even 60% of funded hours are delivered in partnership nurseries. So the extension simply cannot be delivered uh, without them on board. Surely the Minister needs to act urgently to understand and resolve the sector's issues. So what is our urgent plan to meet with the NDNA uh, and address these problems? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I can tell um, Mr Ian Gray that I met with the NDNA this morning at the ninth ELC um, strategy forum, which is the ninth time the government has engaged in that. I've also, since I took post just a few months ago, met with the NDNA um, in, in a private occasion and I have spoken at their conference. I, I Absolutely, um, we recognise and value the key role that providers in the third and private sector have to play in the expansion of funded and early learning and childcare, and particularly, as I said, in delivering the flexibilities that families need. Um, in fact, they are essential to delivering that um, flexibility. On the 1st of April this year, we introduced a new 100% rate relief for private properties, wholly or mainly used as day nurseries. Um, we estimate that rates relief will remove a burden of rates from up to 500 businesses. We're determined to support this sector and we're working very hard with COSLA and local authorities to promote positive and effective partnerships with all of our childcare providers. Ian Gray. Uh, well, in truth, if the Minister has met the NDNA on so many regular occasions, it's perhaps even more worrying that the NDNA have so little confidence in the government's capacity to deliver. And perhaps uh, one reason is that the report makes clear that nurseries are already struggling to deliver the existing 600 funded hours. We know that thousands of parents are unable to access their entitlement through inflexibility uh, of provision. The report doesn't just demand action on the extension, it also demands action now urgently on the existing provision. So what action will the Minister take to address this concern about the existing entitlement? Minister. I can assure um, Mr Ian Gray that we are regularly engaging with the sector um, in we, uh, the national standard consultation, as well as being a, a standard consultation where we put out a survey and asked for responses, we held engagement events. The last engagement event was yesterday. We've held engagement events in Glasgow, Stirling, Edinburgh, Dundee and Kilkwinning. We are working really hard with the sector. And I have to say, at this moment in time, 
This survey, remember, was done before the funding was put in place, before that landmark agreement with COSLA. At this moment in time, there is real positivity about the vision and there's real commitment and passion for high quality within the sector. And we are working really hard with COSLA to promote positive partnerships in all local authority areas. Alison Harris. Thank you. I, I'm glad to hear that the Minister is listening, but in light of the recent Audit Scotland report in March this year, which was very critical of the fact that the Scottish Government had not undertaken sufficient analysis of how successful the delivery of childcare had been after the original increase to 600 hours was in place. So can I ask the Scottish Government, has this now been addressed? Have these concerns you know, been addressed and whether it has put in place a new baseline set of data which will be essential for analysing the delivery of the promised 1,140 hours? Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. I am confident that we will deliver the 1140 hours. We are working, as I said, very closely with our partners and local authority to do that. We have in place um, mechanisms for um, ensuring that we will deliver. We are working really hard. I hope you have an impression in the Chamber of just how hard we are working across the country to engage with all the whole sector to ensure that we can deliver this and we will monitor the impact that it has. Yes. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The living wage is an issue that the NDNA survey flagged up. Uh, can the Minister confirm the Government's plans on early learning and childcare expansion includes a commitment to ensure all childcare staff will be paid at least the living wage? And I remind members I'm the PLO to the Education Secretary. Minister. Absolutely. The Service Model Working Group are working together to develop guidance on what constitutes a sustainable rate, a sustainable rate for local authorities to pay to partner nurseries. And the living wage is absolutely part of that. This incredibly ambitious and challenging expansion of early years in childcare will have an impact right throughout the country. It will deliver living wages in every corner of our nation. Up to 8,000 staff currently working, mostly women, currently working in around 960 partner provider settings will benefit if the living wage is paid to all childcare workers in these settings. And we are absolutely determined to make that happen. Willie Rennie. I share the, the Minister's ambition. I'm just concerned about the reality. We've heard about the NDNA. They're not satisfied so far, but they're not alone. We've got the Accounts Commission, who've had concerns. We've had the Fair Funding for Kids, who've got concerns. The Child Minding Association, they're adding to the list as well. Does the Minister understand the scale of the anxiety in the community about this? Minister. I can assure Mr Willie Rennie that I do understand the level of anxiety about this. I think that this, despite the only 30% response rate for this survey, I think it does very clearly reflect the preoccupations of many NDNA and Early Years Scotland members. We know from all of our contacts and concerns um, that there are real, many private nurseries feel under huge pressure, um, as do childminders, about whether they can continue to operate as viable businesses in the years ahead. And we are absolutely determined to address those concerns. Now that we've reached this landmark funding agreement, we move on to the delivery phase and we are determined to work together with all of our partners who are equally committed <coughs> to deliver this vision. Thank you. We move on to question number two, Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the report by Crisis, which shows that the number of people living in temporary hostel and B&B accommodation in Scotland has risen. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, President Officer, I welcome this report and the work of Crisis Chief Executive John Sparks, who chairs our Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group. Uh, we established the group last year to help us transform temporary accommodation and end homelessness and rough sleeping. Uh, the group has done a fantastic job recently making a number of recommendations for transforming temporary accommodation which we have accepted in principle. There's a focus on preventing the need for temporary accommodation in the first place and proposed measures include the development of a national system of rapid rehousing including to moving to a housing first model for those with the most complex needs. 
Temporary accommodation remains an important part of Scotland's strong homelessness legislation and we are committed to ensuring that te temporary accommodation is of good quality and serves the needs of its residents in helping to ensure positive outcomes for those experiencing homelessness. Jamie Green. I uh, do thank the Minister for that response and may I add uh, thanks from these benches for the ongoing work and interest from crisis in this very complex area. Uh, the Minister uh, talks about the quality of uh, temporary housing and that is a, an important factor. Not all of the temporary accommodation that many are in is adequate and suitable. Uh, uh, crisis also mentioned that really prevention and specifically the point of early investing uh, can ultimately end up saving government's money in this regard. Their figures uh, said that by s spending now to move people out of temporary accommodation into more long-term solutions could actually end up saving around £29 million per year. Can I ask the Minister, uh, is that figure that's recognised by his government, uh, has he done any similar analysis to show what these upfront savings could be by acting in the long term now? And is that a strategy that he's giving serious consideration to? Minister. Um, in terms of the current situation, 81% of those folks in, to in temporary accommodation um, are in mainstream social housing, and I want that number to rise. Uh, as Mr Green will be aware, uh, we have already uh, changed circumstances. In October, uh, we reduced the period uh, from 14 days to seven days uh, that families with children and pregnant women uh, are in unsuitable temporary accommodation, except in the exceptional circumstances, uh, and we will continue uh, to look at that situation. In terms of investment, um, the government has committed to the £50 million pound Ending Homelessness Together Fund uh, over the next five years uh, to bring about the changes that are required and to enact the recommendations that have been put forward um, by HARSAG. Of course, as we uh, continue with that work, uh, we will continue to analyse all of the outcomes and see what benefits that that fund is bringing uh, to people across the country. Jimmy Green. Uh, again, I thank the Minister for uh, that response. Um, he did mention in, in that answer there uh, the issue around social housing. Uh, isn't it inevitable that uh, a fundamental long-term issue seems to be a chronic lack of housing? It can't be a coincidence, Minister, that the hotspots identified in crisis report, such as Edinburgh, East Lothian, Aberdeen and East Renfrewshire, also have very restricted uh, and indeed expensive housing markets. Uh, very few people in the sector genuinely believe that the Scottish Government is on track to meet its 50,000 new affordable homes commitment in this parliamentary session. Uh, can he give us a cast iron guarantee today that by the end of this parliament, 50,000 affordable homes will have been built? Minister. Um, President Officer, a, a very interesting uh, question there from Mr Green. I'm not sure if he's aware of uh, the figures that were published this morning, uh, which shows that the government has built 76,500 affordable homes uh, since we came to power in 2007. Um, and in terms of the 50,000 affordable homes target, which is now 53,000 affordable homes, um, as uh, the First Minister laid out um, at the weekend, um, are we on track? Well, he doesn't need to take my word for it. He just needs to go and look at the report that was put together uh, by Shelter, the Chartered Institute of Housing, uh, and the Equality and Human Rights Commission, uh, who independently assessed strategic housing investment plans and who said uh, that we were on track uh, to deliver uh, on our ambitious target. Um, Mr Green also talked about expensive housing markets. Well, Mr Green could actually help us in that regard by doing a number of things and persuading his Westminster colleagues to change tack. Because in page 15 of uh, the Everybody in Crisis Report, it says that uh, what we require is housing benefit that truly covers the cost of housing and reflects projected rent increases in all areas of the country. On page 368, um, it mentions no recourse to public funds and the hostile environment, uh, which is causing major difficulty for people who have chosen to come and, uh, and live here. Um, and chapter 10 of the report is on making welfare work. 
uh, where it takes to bits the government, the UK government's uh, welfare regime, conditionality, sanctions and benefit cap. So if he wants to help us, I would welcome that, but he needs to talk to his colleagues south of the border to specially help those in the expensive housing markets that he brought up in his question. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd also like to commend Crisis for bringing this report forward. Having taken into account the, the research, I wonder if the Minister could, um, could explain um, what he sees are the main barriers to councils in getting people out of temporary or unsuitable temporary accommodation within seven days and what can be done to reduce these barriers. Minister. Um, I welcome that question. I think that's a very logical question to ask. Um, and we need to um, concentrate uh, on finding out exactly what the barriers are in certain places. As we've heard, in certain parts of the country, um, supply is a difficulty, particularly in those expensive housing markets. Um, and that is one of the reasons why uh, we have committed to delivering 53,000 affordable homes during the course of this parliament. Uh, Ms. Uh, President Officer, uh, Ms Lennon may also be aware um, that the government have set up housing option hubs uh, where practitioners from across the country get together uh, to look at um, what barriers they face and whether best practice can be exported uh, to rid, of, rid us of some of those barriers. Uh, President Officer, in terms of the recommendations um, from the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group, which are extremely important and which we have accepted all of them in principle, apart from a qualification around about some of the funding ones where we require um, uh, Westminster to cooperate in terms of devolving uh, housing benefit to temporary accommodation. We will look at all of these to provide um, the, uh, the right uh, uh, scene uh, to make sure that we get people uh, into homes. Uh, and I can assure uh, Ms Lennon uh, that where are, there are barriers, uh, we will continue to highlight those barriers and we will continue to break them down because we have got to do our best here for our most vulnerable people in society. Can I thank you, the ministers and the members. Apologies to those who couldn't get in there. Uh, but we need to move on to our next item of business, which is a statement by Rosanna Cunningham on Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emissions 2016. And the Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement. So if any member wishes to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary, I would encourage them to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. <laughs> 